Gosh, if you're anything like me, when I first read it, I was like, great, goats, horns, rams, goat, then goat attacks the ram, and then the ram, I have no idea what this says. As Matt said, my name is Jade, and it's my pleasure to unpack Daniel 8 for us today. Um, If you were around last week, we were looking at Daniel 7, actually Matt was preaching, and as we were looking at it, Matt mentioned that a common... um, uh, thing t- as you read this, a common thing to feel as you read this is, in- is you feel intimidated. I think possibly a more common thing to think is, what is this and why am I reading it and who cares and how is this even relevant to my life? I don't know about you, that resonated with me. Maybe I'm just sinful and you're all better than me. Um, I th- <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Honest. Um, One of the most helpful things that I've learned, though, as I approached this passage to prepare for today, was that I needed to come to the passage with the right frame of mind. And what I mean by that is that I needed to understand the place of prophetic writing in the Bible as a whole, and that would help me understand the place of this specific prophecy. Um, There are a few passages, there are a few helpful places we could go to in the Bible to help us understand um, prophetic passages. Um, The one that I've chosen is from uh, Peter's second letter in the New Testament. It's um, Peter's second letter in the New Testament. It's chapter 1, and it starts from verse 19. And this is what it says. Drum roll. There we go. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what's Peter saying here? Peter's saying... um, The prophecies are completely reliable. He's saying that we should listen to them. And why are they reliable? Why should we listen to them? He's saying saying that even though they're spoken by humans, by prophets, they are actually the words of God. And that's why we should be listening to it. And that's the place, um, that's a helpful place to start from. So at this point, you may be asking, how could a ram and a goat that seems to have some sort of severe horn disease be relevant to my life today? That is a great question, and that is exactly what we're going to be talking about. Um, We're going to see how human kingdoms rise and fall continuously, but only the kingdom of God is eternal. We're going to do that by doing two things today. First, we'll look at what does the vision mean. So we'll just go through the vision. We'll try to understand all of it. Um, We'll try to understand what's actually going on in in those verses. And then second, we'll see what it teaches us about God. So what can we learn from this vision about God? Before we jump in, let me just give you a few quick things to help us, again, help us start with the right frame of mind. So number one, Daniel is given a vision of what would happen in the centuries that would follow and tells us the symbols refer to kingdoms that would rise and fall. So what does that mean? When we're reading this vision and we're going to look through it, remember that whenever you see a goat or a ram or a horn, it's representing either a kingdom or a nation or a king. So um, it's quite, it's actually much clearer the, the second or third time that you read it than it is the first time that you read it. So don't worry, breathe out. It's, it's much easier than it looks. Second of all, um, from Daniel's perspective, all these things lie in the future. It's a prophecy, so it's about the future. But obviously from our perspective, these things are actually in the past. So what's prophecy for Daniel is actually history for us. And on that point also, what's amazing is, is our knowledge of history actually confirms um, the prophecy that was given to Daniel. Which means that we see, we can clearly see how God has given this guy in 600 BC, I think he was, Daniel, a vision of what was going to happen between 600 BC and around 165 BC. So you're talking about a span of, you know, hundreds of years. He's given him a vision and we can actually look back and confirm historically that this is true. And you'll see how that happens as we go along. Okay, so with all those things out of the way, let's jump in. Um, Let's understand this vision together. A helpful thing to point out as we jump in is that one of the differences between this week's passage and last week's passage is uh, that Gabriel, the angel in the vision, specifically explains and interprets the vision for us. Um, Last week, Matt said that trying too hard to identify who represents what can be quite pointless. But in this instance, in chapter seven, uh, sorry, in chapter eight, Daniel through Gabriel actually explains, he writes out who we're talking about. 
So what does this mean? You'll notice that the passage naturally divides into two sections. The first section is kind of where we live right now. The first section is we've heard this thing. We've, we've, we've seen this vision. We don't really understand anything. Daniel ends, Daniel ends that ends in, at the end of that second, uh, of that first, sorry, section. Daniel is confused. He doesn't know what's going on until Gabriel comes in and he starts explaining things to him and he explains to him what's actually going on. So Gabriel tells Daniel that there's a ram And there's a goat, okay? And the ram with its two horns, each horn represents a a kingdom. So Persia and Medea. And then the goat in its entirety represents Greece. And the horn represents the first king. So we'll get there, but it's it's exciting. (laughs) Daniel 8.1, let's jump straight in from verse 1. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after one that had already appeared to me. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns. I watched the ram as it charged towards the west and the north and the south. So in verse 1, um, we are told that Daniel, we are, we are shown that Daniel still lives in the Babylonian Empire. How do we know that? Because he's writing in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. And we know from chapter 5 that King Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. So we know the setting of this place. Um, and right from the get-go of this vision, we see that the mighty Babylonians that no one ever thought would be brought to their knees are actually going to fall at the hands of the Persians and the Medes. And that's when our first animal is brought in, the ram. So again, just to clarify, each horn of the ram represents, um, uh, so one of them is Media, one of them is Persia, and they had kind of an alliance together in a way, as, you know, as, al- as allied as countries can actually be. Um, and that's why the ram is one, the one animal. And then the goat is the second animal, which we will see later. Um, and he starts out with one horn, which is the first king, and then, the, then multiple horns come up and... This weird disease thing happens, but I'll tell you about that later. And how do we know all of this information? We haven't jumped out of the Bible yet. We're still in the Bible. In um, verses 20 and 21, Gabriel tells us this. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. So the ram equals this. He's told us. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. So Babylon was going to fall, and the new kingdoms will be extremely powerful and take over the world. Everyone was now thinking, everyone was now thinking, um, surely these are the guys that are going to rule forever. We thought the Babylonians were, but turned out they were weak. It's the Medes and it's the Persians. They're the ones, they're the kings. They're going to rule everything. They thought this until our little goat arrived. Not so little. Um, our second animal with the one horn, which again, remember, it's the first king. It's one ruler over Greece at the time. The goat viciously takes down the ram, or as we now know, um, Greece takes down Media and Persia. So that's where we're up. Verse 7, I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great. So everyone is now thinking, ah, surely this is the kingdom that will never end. Not the Babylonians, not the Persians, not the Medes. It was actually the goat the whole time. This is going to be the one that will rule forever. Babylon fell The Medes fell, and now we have the powerful Greek shaggy goat ruling forever. But as you probably expect, let's look at verse 8 to see how long this kingdom lasts. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off. And in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. As I mentioned at the beginning, although this prophecy in Daniel's time, he was Uh, prophesying about the future. Again, this is our history. So when we look back into history, lots of scholars, you're talking over the centuries, have been studying this. And nearly all scholars agree who this goat is. And they've agreed that it's actually the goat. So we're not talking, so greatest of all times, what we're talking about, we're not talking about Michael Jordan or LeBron and that debate, or if it's Pelé or anyone like that, who we're actually talking about is most scholars confidently say that this goat is the Alexander the Great. He is the powerful commander that even till today is considered one of the greatest um, commanders of all time who did everything that we just heard about and much more um, only by the age of like 31. I'm 30. (laughs) Just putting it out there. Um, 
It's interesting because a lot of the events described here strongly line up with the events around his rule and his death. At the height of Alexander's power, um, when he was around 32, he suddenly died and he didn't have any heirs. So guess what happened? His kingdom was divided into four parts and his generals took over. So the one horn fell off and the four horns grew instead of him. Very interesting. So let's see verse 24, what it says. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. Now, the first king, we're saying, is Alexander the Great. The four horns that replaced the one, we're saying, Alexander died, and his four generals came up instead of him, that was broken off, represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. Now, the last part of the vision gets even more detailed. Even though the four horns take over from the one horn, four kingdoms that replace the one kingdom, they are not as powerful as they used to be. The final piece of the vision is the little horn that came out of one of the other horns and see what it says about it. Out of one of them, out of one of those four horns, came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifices from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. The vision that this overgrown little horn, the vision showed us that this overgrown little horn was going to come in and ravage Daniel's people. He was going to be a force that both wants to conquer land and people physically, but also wants to take a stand against God himself. He stops the people from, of God from sacrificing daily, and he completely destroys the temple, which in this verse we saw called sanctuary. Um, look at what Gabriel says of him in verses 24 and 25. He will become very strong. So this is the little horn, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. The prince of princes here is a reference to God. So he will take his stand even against God. So everyone, guess what they're now thinking? Everyone is now thinking, it's this guy. It's this little horn. This is the most powerful kingdom. We thought it was the Babylonians. We're wrong. It's not the Medes. It's not the Persians. It's not the Greek with the one king. It's not the Greek with the four kings. It's this little horn that's actually now overgrown. This is the kingdom that will never end. His reign will rule forever. The passage ends confirming what I'm sure we all expect by now, um, that even this little horn's reign will end and he will be destroyed. And we have some more interesting historical speculation here, and that's this little horn, and again, nearly all scholars agree on this, this little horn is actually Antiochus IV. Um, this guy came in um, after, uh, again, after those four prominent generals, I think he was a relative of one of them or something, and he came in and he kind of started taking over. He became very powerful. He came to power from 175 BC until 164 BC, and his reign descripts uh, the description of his reign fits quite well with this passage. And you see how he's ravaged, he ravaged the people. He destroyed and killed people because they, he wanted to unite all of his kingdom under one um, religion, which was what we know as the Greek mythology. So anyone who didn't follow his um, religion would be killed and executed. Um, he stopped the daily sacrifices in the temple. He actually slaughtered a pig in one of the temples, which, as you can imagine, is quite a big deal um, for the Jewish people. And ultimately, for the Israelites, sorry, and ultimately try to wipe out anyone who didn't follow his new rules. Whew. After seeing the vision, Daniel says that he was worn out and was exhausted for days. He was appalled by the vision. I really hope you are not appalled at this point in time. <laughs> so that's our vision. So, what's the vision? When we break it down, when we actually understand what's going on, we see that it's kingdoms rising and falling. We see that every power that comes up actually comes back down. So now we understand what the vision was about, and let's jump into our next section, um, which is three things that we can learn from this vision. What can we learn about God from this vision? So if you've zoned out, this is the time to zone back in as we look at these three things. Um, and here they are. One, God is in control. Two, God's kingdom will never end. And three, live on earth in light of God's kingdom. 
So firstly, God is in control. One of the things that could be easily missed um, at this, with this passage, if you just skim over it, is it actually shows who is in control of all of these events. I'll give you a hint. It was never the Babylonians. It was never the Medes or the Greeks in all of its forms. Um, let's look at the passage. I've pulled out three of the verses that helpfully point out what's going on. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It's in this case, we're talking about the little horn. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. One of the main purposes of this passage is to teach and remind us that God is in control. I think in, on the surface level, most of us in a room like this would probably agree with that statement. But here's the truth. A Christian can live their whole lives in even more misery than this world already offers because they do not fully accept that God is sovereign over us, that God is sovereign over this world. God is in control. This is a really helpful quote by a famous theologian named John Calvin. He says, When the light of divine providence has once shone upon a godly man, when someone understands that God is in control, he is then relieved and set free, not only from extreme anxiety and fear that were pressing him before, but from every care. Ignorance of providence, not knowing that God is in control, is the ultimate misery. The highest blessedness lies in knowing it. It gives incredible freedom from worry about the future. So Calvin is saying that ignorance of providence, not knowing that God is in control, is the ultimate misery. But knowing that God in, is in control gives us incredible freedom. It gives you freedom to rejoice and to mourn. When everything seems to fall apart and you realize that you actually have very little control of your life, knowing that God is in control means that you can continue to faithfully do what you were able to do with the knowledge that you have. But you can be trusting God all throughout it. When you have been trying to get pregnant for years, when you're suffering from attacks because of what you believe, when you lose a parent or a child, when your government is corrupt and destructive, knowing when you lose your job, when you try your best every single time and you still fail, knowing that God is in control and will give you freedom, incredible freedom, knowing that whether the ram or the goat seem to be wreaking havoc in your life today, that God is in control, that your God, that our God, he's still sovereign, he's in control, that will give us freedom. I love this short story about a boy who was on a shipwreck. He was in a shipwreck. Um, after a furious storm, he was the only survivor, and the waves swept him onto a rock. He sat there all night long as the storm raged, and the next morning when everything calmed down, he was spotted and he was rescued. Did you tremble while you were on the rock during the night? Someone later asked him. Yes, said the boy. I trembled all night, but the rock didn't. Even though we might tremble, God is a rock and he remains firm. Now, it doesn't mean that we will never be afraid again. It doesn't mean that we will never be anxious again. But it does mean that you can hold on to God until the storm calms. You can trust that he is in control. He is not surprised by any storm and he can keep you afloat. So God is in control and God's kingdom will never end. <clears throat> this is Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Um, so just a few chapters before the passage that we read today. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. One of the main things that Daniel would have learned from his vision is that history is repetitive. As we saw, every time someone takes over, the supposition is that they're going to reign forever. They're going to be the supreme kings over everything and nothing's ever going to change. But it just never happened, did it? There's always someone else more powerful that will come and take over. And we have seen this throughout history. This isn't just a story about 2,500 years ago. The Greeks, the Romans, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Mongols, the Brits, the Russians, soon the US, Iran, China, all of these empires will fall, whether they like it or not. I think we have seen so many movies and TV shows that we have become desensitized to this truth. And I want us all to think about this question because it's not a simple answer. And the question is, how can we grasp the enormity of the news that everything that we know will eventually come to an end? 
How can we actually understand the enormity of the news that everything that we know will eventually come to an end? And then in light of that, how do we live our lives now? I think that's the question that we're going to continue for the rest of our lives struggling with and trying to figure out. Kingdoms have been rising and falling since the creation of man, but for some reason, these generations, our generations, think that our kingdoms won't fall. For some reason, we think that we are immortal. For some reason, we think that surely our tech giants, our current, current political powers, they won't fall. Surely Apple will never fall. Surely Apple will always be better than Samsung. <laughs> like it will, but <laughs> like eventually it'll fall. <laughs> but it'll still be better than Samsung. I think COVID has reminded all of us that all companies, all properties, all ideas of job security, investments, our bank accounts, everything, they're far less secure than we might be tempted to believe. Just like the kingdoms that we've been looking at, they are proven to constantly rise and fall. Like Daniel, we are called to see the repetitiveness of history. We are called to see that commanders and leaders and goats and rams come and go, but the kingdom of God is the only thing that is set up, that it will never be destroyed. So God is in control. God's kingdom will never end. And now we are to live on earth in light of God's kingdom. One of the things that I touched on at the beginning was um, coming to this passage with an understanding of how it fits in the whole, like in, in the entire biblical narrative um, and how important that is. Now, verse 13 from last week, which Matt touched on last week, uh, it really helpfully pulls together all these things that we've been looking at. And it helps us understand how Daniel's prophecies were not only pointing forward to the end of Babylon, but also they're pointing forward into our future. Let's look at verse 13 again from chapter 7. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and all peoples from every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. As we heard last week, one like a son of man is referring to Jesus. So Jesus is the one that has been given authority and power. Jesus is the one whose kingdom will never end. And now with that in mind, let's close on, on let's look back at verse um, 27 of our passage, which is the last verse of our passage, um, remembering that Jesus' kingdom is the one that will never end. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. It's pretty clear that Daniel was greatly disturbed by the vision. He was distraught, and he actually took a few mental health days off to recuperate. But when he did, when he felt a bit better, he got up and he went about the king's business. And this is a really helpful point for us to end on today. Daniel got all of these visions, but he was still called to serve where he was. He was still called to serve, in his case, the king of Babylon. We are called to live in our earthly kingdoms and serve our earthly kings. How? With the recognition that there is a king over them, that there is a king over our managers and our bosses. There is a king, there is the king over our premiers and even our prime ministers. When we put our trust in Christ, remember Christ is the one who has been given all authority and sovereignty. He's the king who, whose kingdom will never end. When we put our trust in Christ, we declare him king over us. That's what we're doing. We are making a conscious decision to submit to his authority and to serve him. So we want to live as God's people. We want to live as God's people who are called to live in these earthly kingdoms, but still serve our heavenly king. Let's pray together that we may submit and serve our heavenly king. Father, thank you that you are good. Thank you for your providence. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you that we can trust you even in the hard times. We know, Father, that um, we go through so much tri trials. We go through so many trials we don't know what's happening so many times. This world is so broken. And we don't know what to do. But what we can rely on is we can know that we can trust you. 
Help us hold on to you. Help us hold on to the rock and trust you in the midst of the storm. Trust that you are in control. In Jesus' name, amen.